Um, so welcome everybody. Um, oh great, Florida, wonderful. Uh, hi Carolina. Um, my name is Elsa Vie, and um, I lead the Boston University African Studies K-16 education program, as some of you know from uh, being in previous sessions together. Um, so our main mission is to support teachers in um, uh, increasing the reach of African studies in the classroom. Um, we do this in a number of ways, uh, including offering online curriculum, professional development events. We have a physical library of teaching resources, which unfortunately currently doesn't quite matter at the moment, and um, a Teaching Africa teacher certificate program. And joining me in support of this session tonight is Anna, Anya Weno um, at the Outreach Program at the African Studies Center at Howard University. And so I encourage you to um, check out both of our websites for resources, events, curriculum, and so on. Um, so today our session is, we're here to discuss colonialism through the lens of Creole, which we'll take as an archive. So taking the language itself as an archive. Can you share in the chat box whether you speak a form of Creole yourself or have experience with Creole or teach it in relation to colonialism? So do you speak it? Do you have experience, knowledge of it? Um, do you teach it in relation to teaching about colonialism? Um, and if you haven't, that's absolutely okay. That's why you're here. Okay, I teach it, but minimally, Leah, yeah. Anybody else want to add? I talk about it in French class. Wonderful. Mostly knowledge of Haitian Creole, Emily. Yeah, Megan, great to see that you do it in French. Haitian, yeah. Looking to learn more. Great, wonderful. Anybody else? Oh, good. Yeah, great. Wonderful. Um, so when we teach about colonialism, it's, I think, really, as an entry point, easy to remain focused on large scale dynamics. But the micro processes of language are really central. It's a central dynamic in colonial encounters. So we're going to use the lens of language as an archive. And we'll look closely, because language is what instantiates the contact between cultures. And the way we interpret this archive is also important. So I always tell my students, it's not just so much the, the primary source or the archive, it's what lens are you using to actually analyze it? What tools do you have to analyze it? So part of this presentation today is going to tell the story of Creole as a story of unfinished um, decolonization. So the, our essential question tonight is what can Creole and especially the science about Creole, so the science of linguistics in particular, tell us about colonialism? How can it shed light in a deeper level? Um, so our goals, um, take a minute. I, I, I like to pause the talking uh, when I teach just because uh, of the long tradition of monolingual or monodirectional flow of, of talking. So look at our objectives and the agenda and topics. Okay, there is a full lesson and a resource that we've written that supports this workshop and it's available here. Um, Anya is linking it right now. So the full lesson, everything I'm gonna cover today is available. You don't need to take any notes on this if you don't want, and you, you will also won't need it during the workshop today, but I'm sharing it right now so that you can have it for your records and it includes a resource list. It also includes a set of key vocabulary that grounds this lesson. Uh, as you know, it's important to foreground the new concepts that students will encounter for a diversity of learners. And here is a full list. Um, so we'll learn about language dominance. We'll learn about indirect rule and neocolonialism and glottophagy and the difference between trade and settlement colonies. We'll talk about central colonial language planning. Um, we'll also talk about language ideology quite a bit. Um, one way I like to do language is I like to give students a blank list of concepts when I start a unit and I uh, ask them to define those concept concepts throughout the, the time that we discuss a, um, a topic because um, it really, really can be helpful for them to develop a working glossary, but also it can, it can be a form of assessment for them as well. So I definitely encourage you to make this list of vocabulary in, into an assessment or, or a, a support document. 
Um, so let me start by sharing a little bit of context. Um, how many of you know about Mauritius, first of all? Say, say if you know a little bit about Mauritius and what you know in the chat box, I'm curious, or even the Indian Ocean. Okay, a little bit, great. Great. For me, it's always it's always great when people even know where it is because it's so 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 far from here. Um, great, great, wonderful. That's why you're here. Um, so this uh, picture is a 19th century engraving of Port Louis. So we're going to be looking at a time period about a hundred years earlier, but it still can evoke a little bit of the island that is Mauritius and especially at the time of the early settlement. So Mauritius is a collection of islands. Um, oftentimes it's been talked as the main island right here, but in fact it includes Tromelin Island, which is disputed territory with France, Agalega, Saint-Brandon, Rodrigue, and this disputed territory of the Chagos Archipelago, which is um, has, the main island of the Chagos, as you may know, is the island of Diego Garcia, and that has a massive military, US military base. So that is also highly disputed territory with uh, the, the, and I can go on after this some other time, but um, it's an interesting case study in, in US imperialism. At, at, um, so it's often represented as being only Mauritius, but there are people almost everywhere in all of the islands. It's also, I want to mention that it's right next to Reunion, which is this island right here. And Reunion is formerly known as Bourbon, which is where you get your vanilla name from, Bourbon Vanilla. And Reunion is still a département d'outre-mer, so it's still a French colony. Um, I'm going to turn now to looking a little bit at um, place names, because um, to look at the region's history, place names can tell a really good story. So we're going to look at, at toponymical analysis of um, the evolution of the of what what Mauritius was called over the years and it's purposely not dated right here so I want you to take a moment to look at the various names of Mauritius and what they were called over the years and make a list of who uh, you think was in power over the years um, just make a list you we have you we have six arrows seven arrows here or six arrows make a list of about at least five different um, ruling powers that you think um, steered the, the history of Mauritius. So feel free to share in the chat box. Okay. Yep, so, yep. Arabia, yeah, Dutch, Omanis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, all, all good, uh, all good guesses. Anybody else want to try to um, give a guess? Yeah, the, uh, yeah. This would have been pre Saudi, uh, pre Saudi Arabia, of course, it would have been Arabia, but absolutely, yes, Holland, France, 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 Persians for number two. Okay, good. Um, so let's look at um, what uh, the actual um, what the actual uh, different settlements were. So the Arabs actually landed on the islands, and perhaps Steve, uh, you're right. They they likely were from um, Oman uh, region, and definitely from the larger uh, Gulf Peninsula. So they landed various times starting around the year 900. Uh, the Portuguese also landed. So this is where we get our name Dina Arobi, which means a faraway land uh, island. It was, was it's so far off of the coast. If you go back to, to the map, it's um, at least 500 miles off of the main coast. So uh, it, it's very hard and it would have been very hard to settle at the time. Chirne is the Portuguese word for Swan Island. As you know, Mauritius is the only place in the world where dodo birds have existed. So um, this is where this name, this Portuguese uh, name uh, came from. They too never settled because of distance. Um, the Dutch are the ones, and you, you were absolutely right, those of you who said uh, Holland, the Dutch were the first to, to the island to use the island as a port of trade for ebony and spices along their way to India. 
And then as they heard that the French Compagnie des Indes, which was the colonial company, which was based in Reunion, that island at the time, that, that neighboring sister island that I showed you in the map, as they heard that the, the French were going to take over Mauritius, the Dutch tried to establish a colony, which is why you have two sets of dates right here. Um, and, and they're the ones who introduced sugar. So Mar Mauritius was used um, as a refreshing station for Dutch East India people on their journeys between Europe and East Asia. Um, but they then abandoned the, the island and they left, um, they, they left many Maroon peoples here. And I want to um, just point out here um, that when I'm talking about colonial powers, I'm also talking about the immense amount of exploited labor um, that came from various parts of the world to support the violence of colonial powers. Um, I think too often we tell this story uh, from the perspective of those in power. Um, so to note here how many different peoples have come throughout um, uh, come to Mauritius throughout the years, and uh, that has that matters greatly when we talk about language and Creole. Um, so the Dutch, the Dutch um, abandoned the island eventually, um, and the French, unfortunately for the Maroon peoples who had been able to escape to the high plateaus of the island, they came shortly afterwards and they settled the island in 1710 um, with primarily enslaved Malagasy's and West Africans. So this is where you see the difference between trade colonialism, ah, there, there's my, my keyword, and settlement colonialism, um, which was the feature of, uh, of, of French and British colonialism. And again, I'm mentioning these differences because there's a lot of writing about how those two types of colonialism have had a different impact on language developments. Um, uh, so then, as you know, uh, the, so the French ruled for um, not so long compared to the, to the British before the island was independent in 1968. England had its eyes set on Ile de France, so France called it Ile de France. They occasionally raided the islands and they set up blockades to cripple trade. And in November 1810, they fought a battle and France capitulated in, in December 1810. So this is um, here when we think about French and British colonialisms as uh, the really perfect case study for what we call uh, direct rule and indirect rule. Okay. Um, the change of power between France and England was very smooth, quote unquote, of course, for the ruling elite, not for, for, not for the exploited um, uh, folks who, who supported these empires. Um, the, basically, the island's upper class thought that their financial interests would be best served by cooperating with the British. So one of the reasons this transition happened like it was is that the island's laws and customs and religions and, and private property, even free trade, and even the French language were fully respected by the British when they when they took over. So the British are typically known to, to have this indirect rule where they work with the elite in power, whereas France very directly intervene culturally, uh, linguistically, which had uh, obviously a massive impact on identity and language. And even though Brit Britain, if you look, ruled for so much longer than the, um, than the French, um, English still plays uh, not as central of a role as you would have thought for the for the length of time. Okay, so with this history, I want us to fast forward to today. Um, today, there's over 85% of Mauritians, citizens of independent Mauritius, who speak Creole as a mother tongue at home. It, Creole is the language of Mauritius. So before we get into the details of language in relation to colonialism, I want, um, I want you to experience Creole directly. So I'm going to teach you a few basic expressions here. Um, I'm going to ask for your participation and your verbal participation on this. So uh, I'm going to go through this list of words. And as I'm teaching you, and you can repeat after me, you can unmute yourselves. Um, you and, it, and it, it won't work great in terms of sound, but that's absolutely okay. The idea is to have a little bit of a call response here. Uh, I want you to pay attention to what you hear uh, in Creole. Cosé means hello. Can you repeat after me? Cosé. Cosé. Oh, I hear somebody was able to unmute. Um, Anya, are you able to unmute people? Um. Let's let's see if you scroll next to their names. Let me let me try. 
There should be a way to unmute. I heard somebody, so. That was me. Yeah, okay, okay, <laughs> good, good. Give me one moment. I do not see the option. I am looking. Um, uh, in the participant late list next to every name. Um, there is an option for audio. Um, else to unmute. Uh, there we go. Um, anyway, we can go on if it if we if we work out um, if it works out that's mm -hmm. great. Um, but if it doesn't, um, you can just speak out in the comfort of your own homes. That's absolutely no problem. Oh, oh good, I can hear people. Oh, good. Um, yes. Great. Um, so, Kuze. 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 Bonjour. Bonjour. Which means hello. Okay. Kuze. 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 And Kuze also means speak, but it also means it means hello. Qui uh, manière, which means how, how are you? Qui manière? Qui manière? Qui manière? Qui manière? Great. Mo correct ou? Mo correct ou? Ah, okay. Mo pe caspake. Mo pe caspake. I'm doing great. Okay. Mo correct ou is a little bit more nuanced. Mo pe caspake means really you're it, literally it means breaking all the packages. So uh, I'm doing great. Um, salam. 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 Bye. Uh, au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Au revoir. Hey, okay. so um, you all sound great. Um, anybody want to try to do a, a little dialogue with me? Uh, would like to volunteer? I, I can't hear. I see Megan's volunteering. Okay, Megan, you and I. Cosé, okay. Megan. Cosé, El Elsa. Qui manière? Mo uh, correct ou? Mo bien, merci. Mo pe caspake. Ah, bien. Salam. Salam. Au revoir. Bye. Great. Thank you so much, Megan. That was fabulous. Anybody else? Carolina is raising her hand. Okay, great. Thank you. Carolina. Bonjour, Carolina. Carolina, you are muted. If she can't unmute herself. Oh. Uh, okay. There. All right. Now. Uh, now Carolina, bonjour. Bonjour. Eh, bonjour. Qui manière? Mo correct. Ou? Mo bien. Mo picasse paquet. Salam. Au revoir. Great, wonderful. Um, thank you all. Uh, does anybody, any two of you want to try a little dialogue in Creole? Okay, well, you all sounded great and it was really heartwarming for me to hear Mauritian Creole being spoken. Um, I do wanna say that if you ever want to do uh, this with your students, there's a much longer vocabulary list that is uh, included with pronunciation guide in the, the lesson and the resource that was shared earlier. Um, so definitely don't hesitate to refer to it. Um, my question to you now is, do you recognize any cognates? I know several of you, I see Dumas in the, in the audience. I'm so happy to see you here. I know several of you have experience with Haitian, Haitian Creole as well. Uh, uh, you, you hear, okay. Um, yes, yes. Okay, so you hear cognates from your own background knowledge. Yeah, cousin. Um, so uh, what are the, you, what cognates, what is the language that you associate? Oh yeah, okay, au revoir. Yep. Salam from Arabic Sohili. Yep. Exactly. And French. Okay. So several of you are saying correct, correct. Exactly. In French, there's a, there's a, um, association there. Great. Yeah. Bonjour. Bonjour. Absolutely. Okay. So let's, um, uh, you're all right, but we're going to unpack this a little bit further. Um, so Mauritius is part of many countries who, uh, which speak their own forms of Creole. Okay. Oops, I wanted to go back here. There. Okay, well, my, my um, I think I'm, 
I didn't mean to, to show the, the, um, the vocabulary word, but that's okay. Um, so if you look here a little bit at this map, okay, this is a map from the Atlas of Pigeons and Creole Structures Online. Uh, it's a full online resource. It's, it's also included in the lesson that was linked at the beginning of, the, of this session. Um, you'll see uh, my own knowledge base is situated in the Creoles of the Indian Ocean, so Seychelles, Reunion, and Mauritius, and also Rodrigue that have some regional differences. The common factor across these contexts is that Creoles emerge as a hybrid language in a situation of language contact, and to be more precise, Creole began in a situation of language power differences between social groups. So a lot of language flowered from the situation of contact and unfortunately through the violence of slavery. So um, a quote, a uh, famous quote says uh, that people were in circumstances where they were suddenly rendered inarticulate because they were not being taught the language that they were being dominated in and that they often needed to use to speak to one another. So we have to think about Creoles as a language born out of power, resistance, and the adaptation to power. Okay, so Creoles are, are languages, but there's also a lot of circulating ideas that are constructed about them, uh, which we can call ideologies. So typically I wouldn't, you know, if this is with student, I wouldn't put that vocab vocabulary uh, word there. Um, so if we take this, even just this map, as an artifact itself uh, and look at the legend, what language ideologies do you see here in the way Creoles are defined? Feel free to share in the chat box or it's a small enough group that we, you can also speak out now that you have the ability to. It's kind of ironic that we're in a session called cause, which means speak and you're all muted. Um, but um, defined by the colonizing power, yeah, Kathleen, yeah in relation to a dominant colonizing language. Absolutely, Leah. English, French, Spanish, colonialism. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, oh, great. Yeah, I know. This is the, the, the symbolic part of the lesson that everybody should be able to unmute, because yeah. Um, so you can tell that uh, as you as as you all shared in the chat box that Creoles are always defined and even in a, in a good resource like the Atlas of Pigeons and Creoles online are always defined in relation to their mostly European languages, but to the dominant languages, the language of power that that gave birth to it. Okay. So those are some ideas and already embedded this, this map as an artifact itself can be taken for as a tool of analysis of what are, uh, how is Creole defined. If we go to the lens of science, okay, and here I'm going to introduce two, um, two different theories about Creoles, um, although there's many, many other debates within social historical linguistics. Linguists believe that in a situation of language contacts uh, that requires communication, the parties involved simplify their language and they produce a pigeon. So pigeon typically emerge in trade colonies, which uh, developed around trade forts or along trade routes. So for example, in on the coast of West Africa, pigeons are typically reduced in structures and they're very specialized in function, typically trade, right? Uh, uh, there's a port where there's many different kinds of people, the need to communicate <clears throat> for, for economic purposes. So a, a pigeon is then produced. And so initially in these in these very specific spaces, these trade, these trade ports, they served as, if you will, um, lingua francas to facilitate interaction and transactions. But in, in those cases, the speakers always retain their mother tongue. And some pigeons have even expanded to almost regular vernaculars like Nigerian and uh, Nigerian pigeon English and Cameroon uh, pigeon English as well. Um, the theory goes, so this theory goes that the next generation of children, so once uh, you have a pigeon going on in a certain space, the children of the folks speaking the pigeon learn the grammatical rules involved in the pigeon as native speakers, and then a creole is born, so a, a stable language, because um, I won't get into too much detail about the, 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 um, the theory, but that we are all born with a universal grammar, and so once we're born into a language, it stable, stay, stabilizes the language. So Creoles are said to have developed there where, where, where settlement colonies, so, which means that there would have had to have a longevity um, to, to the settlement. 
Um, and especially where the primary industry consisted of sugar or rice uh, cultivated by exploited slave labor. So again, language born of, out of power differences um, and an incredible act of resistance as well. The next theory that linguists often talk about, and this is an important one because we're going to question its validity later, and uh, we're going to question it in, in um, a conversation style. But with students, I would really point them to the substrate, superstrate uh, theory because there, there, there are problems with them and ask them to really probe deeply and what, what might be the problem there. Uh, so linguists theorize that most Creole languages have an African or other lexicon, which they refer to as the superstrate, or they also call it the um, acrolect and an African or an other substrate, which they also call a basilect. And the substrate consists of everything non-vocabulary related. So grammar, syntax, and non-vocabulary elements, intonation, and so on. And so as an example, you all mentioned hearing the French in the short, short Creole lesson earlier. And of course, um, that's why the map that as an art ideological artifact has French based, English based and so on. So that assumption that, um, that it's based all vocabularies derived from um, et et etymologically derived from the, the colonial language. Um, and that so that they're lexified by these dominant languages. It's still this is a theory that's still great in many ways, because uh, it does say that um, there's an African basis to the substrate, the syntax, the grammar, and so on. But we'll talk a little bit more about that question of vocabulary and lexicon. So these, in sum, are the two main theories about uh, in linguistics about Creole. So let's look a little bit now at um, the language policy and the contact in the colony. So I want you again, uh, this is just a slide to be evocative of um, Port Louis, the capital of Mauritius, which was then known as Ile de France. Um, this is again an engraving of about 100 years later of the period that we're going to be looking at, but it can still serve to fuel imagination. So if you were in the streets of this island um, in the 1700s, what, and you could listen in on people talking, uh, what languages would you expect to hear? Say in the, in the chat box what you would expect to hear, given what you know now about the history um, and so on. Arabic. Okay, Gail. Yeah. Creole. Yeah. Portuguese, Alana. Yeah. Probably some Dutch. English a little. Could be since there were raids in the in the uh, on the French colony on the French Ile de France. Okay, Malagasy. Yeah. Yeah, great. So, um, yeah, a more Arabized form of Swahili. Yeah, Swahili, yeah, for sure. So now let's look a little bit um, closer here as a primary source, um, the colonial, the data from colonial reports. Who was arriving at Ile de France outside of the French up until, uh, up until about 1770? And um, the reason why we're looking at this period um, is that the first text that was found in Creole and Mauritius dates back to 1749. And it, it is thought of as a more stabilized Creole at the time. So that's why um, the, the language is considered to be stabilized by, by that period. So who arrived at that period it really matters. So take a look at, to look at the table. People from which geographical and cultural backgrounds came to the island. And feel free to raise questions and, um, and Okay, great, great question, Kathleen. There's no, um, there's no indigenous population. Uh, thanks for bringing that up. I meant to mention that when we looked at the map. Uh, no indigenous population. Uh, it was an, an empty island uh, full of dodos. So the dodo bird is, is from Mauritius. Yeah. So it, it also, in Mauritius, there, the claims to indigeneity and a post-colonial equitable world become also very complicated when it, currently in current local politics because there's, there's no, um, it was entirely empty, yeah. So there might have been Wolof, Megan, yes, 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 absolutely, here, so Yolof here is to be taken for Wolof, yeah. Modern day Mali and Senegal, yeah, absolutely. 
Yeah. What else? What would you uh, expect? The formative inputs, it's a kind of technical term to basically say, how is Creole, what influences Creole is made of? Yeah. Okay, what was the religious makeup percentage of Christian versus Muslim? Good, good point. Uh, we'll talk about this when we talk about the, the governing documents. But here we're talking about the French period and um, this would have been um, definitely, uh, as far as power over, definitely uh, Christian uh, with a host of different um, other religions from, from Africa and the Indian subcontinent. So great. Of course, if you're doing this with students, I, um, you know, this kind of terminology, I, I, it's very important to question it, enslaved versus slaved. So definitely use it as enslaved uh, to put the action back into the people who did what to whom. Um, slaves belonging to the company here. Um, I also would urge, you know, this term imported, you know, to have some explicit reflective conversations around how problematic this language is um, uh, with, with students. So. At any rate, here um, you are definitely right in everything that you said. Um, the Wolof, Bambara, Bengali, Tamil, uh, Juda can be taken to be Wida, so present day Bena, uh, Madagascar, Mozambique, so Kikuyu, um, Senegal, Bengalis, and Tamils. Um, and this is a summary of all non Francophone arrivals by the year 1758. So you can clearly see that Malagasis features in high numbers and that there were steady arrivals also from India. And um, in the first table, you can see that uh, West Africans really feature prominently, in, especially in that first wave. Um, so the second part of the top table also shows that there might have been people coming from, um, or that there, there, that there were people calling, coming from Mozambique um, around the year 1740. So this is immense diversity. And we also have to imagine the different arrivals. Uh, so the different ships that came to the island, sailors would have brought nautical dialects. There's a host of different register specific kinds of speak that would have entered the island. And newly arri arrived people would have come in wave. So you can't really assume that there was any mutual intelligibility among the enslaved community. Uh, so new arrivals would have shifted the approximation of a language and new, even new arrivals would, would shift again that approximation of an approximation. Um, and to respond to the question of language here, uh, uh, another part of an, a, a terrible uh, part of the context uh, and what was governing the context at the time is the Code Noir, was the awful legal governing document that was adopted under Louis XV. It was adopted in Réunion, which was in Bourbon, as I mentioned, but in Mauritius uh, as of 1723. The French had lots and lots of working economic interests and the, the Code Noir governed the relations between Europeans and the people, the enslaved, and it was centered on the production of sugar. Um, so as a legal document, it, it regulated social relations and it included a religious dimension. Uh, uh, so this is why uh, Christianity became a power over and, uh, and a tool of oppression, rules about sexual relations and marriage, and it also had an economic dimension as well um, around Pro private property, uh, ability to sell sugarcane, and so on. And of course, all of this was mediated by language. Um, this major document, uh, uh, piece of legislation for the French um, empire was coupled with um, a centralized language policy. So here you can see an excerpt from Ordonnance de Villiers Cotteret. And of course, with students, it would be a, a good approach is to have them read this and really think through in terms of inquiry, um, what does this mean that France was having a centralized language policy? So it dates back to as early as 1539, where France was trying to consolidate its language. A uh, hundred years later in 1637, Cardinal Richelieu founded the Académie Française. And so this centralized language planning of promoting French in order to rule, it, so initially in the metropole, it was to rule over all of the regional nobles, which each serve their language, but it had direct impact on the colonies as well. 
Um, so in the resource list, I've included a really great lecture by Professor Hutchinson, um, who's a linguist at Boston University, who did a custom lecture for us um, for this particular workshop. Um, and he discusses the power of this francophony that reached through uh, throughout the, the, the again, problematic term to talk about to talk about these places as francophone places. Um, so this centralized language planning um, is an important concept because of the consolidation. And one key question to ask is why did territorial advancement coincide with centralized language planning? Um, of course, that it, 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 it allowed for domination, right? The answer to that is domination, but it, this is an important um, uh, way to um, engage students in thinking about the role of language. So while many people came to Mauritius with different linguistic backgrounds, it's clear that the target language would have been French. And target language is a term um, used by Derrida uh, or an approximation of French. And the combination of the central policy, the code noir, the need for communication, the need to survive in a situation of French dominance. So the means of communication had to have include the French. Um, it's likely to have evolved into a pigeon, which was then solidified into a creole with the first generation of children. Um, and so there's a giving up of languages that would have happened here. There's an entire giving up of languages. And there's also the amazing creativity of producing a new language. So I, I with students, I have often done this activity in um, in for more than one purpose, but it can be uh, a very important experiential activity of looking at what is the effect of a dominant language constraint on your ability to speak, okay? Um, so I would like to have one volunteer, um, if you will, to participate in this activity, which really eats, illustrates this concept of glottophagy, which is the eating up of languages. Um, so the volunteer, the first volunteer, it's, a, it's an easy task. Um, is what did you do during your last vacation? If you wouldn't mind, um, be willing to speak about this in um, three to five sentences. Anybody would like, I can't see everybody. So um, feel free to just speak out if you want to talk about, um, if you are willing to share what you spoke, um, what you did in your last vacation. I can volunteer if you want. Please, yes. All right. Uh, I went to visit my family in Bogota, Colombia. I traveled with my two daughters and we celebrated my dad's 95th birthday. Great. Thank you so much uh, for volunteering for that. Now, would you be willing to please say what you said again, but without letters, um, without the E letter. So use words, all the words you want, but no words that have an E in it. I went to Bogota, Colombia to visit my family. My two daughters went with no my dad's ninth fifth birth birthday. <laughs> Thanks for trying. I know it's very, very, very hard. Um, so thank you for for uh, sharing that again. Would anybody else like to uh, challenge themselves and say what you did in your last vacation and jump right in without using avoiding words that have the letter E and the letter T? I need a volunteer here to try this out. It must be too difficult. I know, I know. Oh, I can try, but I'm gonna mess up a lot. I know. That's okay, that, that's sort okay, of- No that, E and no T. So <laughs> I took kids who oh, For no, I can't do it. I can't do it at all. It's like I can't even do it. 
I'm trying to say that I took kids to Europe for educational travel, <laughs> like last June. Great, great, great. Uh, not great, of course, because I know it's a terrible feeling to um, to be suddenly constrained in that way. So one question, if you had to say, um, and this is, of course, just an experiential activity is very short. But one question that I want to ask the two of you who courageously volunteered is how does it feel to be in a situation with such a constraint um, imposed on your ability to speak? You can say in the chat box or just share out loud. It really slows you down. Mm -hmm. um, you know that people are not going to understand. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What else? It kind of, I mean, I, I guess in this context, I just kind of felt silly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, the, the sort of human dignity is lost in many ways in the communicative situation. Um, so the, the exercise with done with students can, can serve just as an entry point to introduce this concept of glottophagy uh, that simulates a challenging linguistic situation when a new context suddenly imposes um, constraints on your ability to express yourself. And ultimately, there's an act of silencing. You both, you both uh, spoke much slower. You had to think through, um, and your and your sense of self in a communicative situation, and that can can as an exercise that can help students reflect on the challenges that so 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 many people would have faced linguistically and socially when arriving on the island. So now we want to turn our attention itself to um, to Creole itself as an archive. Okay. Um, this might tell a little different story than what the linguists say about um, substrate and superstrate. Okay, the, the again, just to recall the, the vocabulary being the um, superstrate uh, of the dominant language and then the substrate grammatical situation. So this is a list of vocabulary word. Um, so what can you conclude from this list of words? Take a look at it. And in which ways is Creole an African language, an other language? And what do these Creole words suggest about the, this ideology um, or this theory from linguists? Take some time to look at them carefully, the, the meaning, the influence. Mm -hmm. Food vocab is African. Yep, the lexicon is certainly not European or not only European. Yep, this would have been Kikuyu in, in the so pre nation state, so uh, in the Mozambique area. Yep. Words related to important things are not Europe. Yes, so, so what you call what? So um, what are the objects that you define around yourself um, really matters, right? It's not just daily life words, it's important words. It's words related to disease. It's words related to food. It's words related to state of minds. Mm -hmm. So yeah, uh, there's there's many influences, many African languages, and here I have completely omitted the immense influence that came with um, under uh, you know basically 150 years later when the British were in power, um, because the 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 history of the island really bifurcated then toward um, waves and waves of Indian Indian indentured uh, workers. So the Creole is also fully infused by Tamil and Urdu and Marathi and Hindi words. Yeah, Gail is asking, what, uh, was Madagascar the most important trading partner? Um, Madagascar would have been a port, um, uh, you know, a, a stop point on the on the way back to Europe. At the, at the time, it wouldn't have been the uh, a major trading partner, uh, but it certainly was a trade. Uh, it was part of the slave trade. 
and that, uh, which is why you see the very strong Malagasy influence. And if you connect this language as archive, right, Creole as archive, this archive with the archive of the colonial reports, and you do an analysis of those two sources in tandem, you can definitely um, uh, conclude how important Malagasy culture and language were to the formation of Mauritius. Yeah. So what do, do these Creole words suggest about the ideology surrounding the substrate and superstrate? I know Emily said that, that there are several influences. Yeah. Anybody else would like to build on that? Okay. Um, so the substrate superstrate theory is still, you take any linguistics class Oh, it confirms that Juma says, in which way? Um, so, so here, I'll, I'll just offer some, cl some clarification about Juma, do you wanna speak out and share instead? To say why it confirms- Can you hear me? To you? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Right, uh, as I was, reading uh, the words, um, I, I could certainly see the, um, the, the substrate and, and, and superstrate to the extent as I look at, for example, uh, Nubia, uh, any Meoritic language, uh, there is no vowels, right? Mm -hmm. uh, in that end, but with the Creole word, definitely there are uh, lots of vowels being used. I couldn't identify like um, what I would, I don't know, like, like a, a, a language it, that did not come in contact with uh, colonialism, looking at the Creole words. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you mentioning Nubia and other influences, um, one of the, the issues with the substrate and superstrate model, and, and what I was going to say is that uh, you take any language class at the moment, any language and contact class, um, and you, this is taught as sort of, this is the way it is. There's no, there's no, you know, this kind of table never becomes part of the object of analysis. So we keep on reproducing and reproducing this, you know, it's French based, it's English based, it's a Creole, it's always derived from, it's always a dialect of, it's always in th this relation. Uh, to the dominant language. Absolutely, Emily. I feel it's an attempt to re reduce language to black and white, for sure. Yeah. Um, and even the terminology, superstrate and substrate, I mean, it's great that there's an African basis to the language in etymology, perhaps in sounds, um, but it's, uh, it's also in vocabulary. It's also in vocabulary. Um, so it's, it, it's a very problematic, uh, problematic way. And it, um, uh, to continue saying this is an ideological stance. And again, I think it's important for students to understand um, ideology as a constructed idea, and it reinforces the colonial language. Um, we need to reframe Creole in its righteous, multicultural, creative resistance to colonial power. It was born out of the ability to speak as, and so, and the, there's so many multicultural influences with a firm grounding in African and also other language grammars. So that's, this is why Kuze is in the title. Kuze is to speak, but to make Creole speak. Um, Creoles are legitimate languages outside of the relationship that they have to the colonial situation that gave birth to them. So I also want to say that to, to your point, Duma, that um, you mentioned Nubia, the, the science of etymology itself is problematic, right? right? Because right. Um, you, it, etymology has, you know, when you open a dictionary, you look for a word and you says, oh, it, it derives from the Greek or it derives from the Wolof. And there's a direct causality attributed to some original language onto um onto creole there's a direct causality and that is highly problematic because a, a word itself could have been um taken so the original itself could have been taken from other sources so as far as nubia which is what what made me think about what you said so the word tomat in creole comes from 
you know, you would think any any colonial reading of the situation would say tomate in Creole comes from the from the French tomate. You know, it's almost like a homonym in that sense because it sounds exactly the same. But um, when you look at the etymology of tomate in French, it's it says it's derived from Portuguese. Um, and then from the Portuguese itself, it de derived from the Nahuatl, the Aztec language. Um, mm. So, so the science of etymology itself, in its looking for direct causal relationships to some original language, is itself an ideological stance. It's itself a way to, um, you know, continue to trace these connections to to powers that have dominated and that have used language to dominate and that continue to use language to dominate uh, the Creoles. Okay. So um, I see lots of comments there, but I'll definitely go back to, uh, to, to them in a little bit. So why this is important, um, I, I think it, 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 there's a self-evidence to why this is important. Um, but in particular, if we fast forward to the present to make connections to contemporary issues, we see that these um, same ideologies that started under racist colonialism and enslavement have traveled all the way up to now and they're present in science and they're, they're present in public discourse. There's ongoing racism. So let me just read this slide. This is a quote from a, a statement in the Mauritian press, which is uh, fairly recent, 2018. Creole is nothing but a patois, the daughter of French. Written Creole is a plague that should be fully avoided in the schools. I wanted you to to hear this, and I'm sure those of you who who, who have knowledge of the politics of uh, Haitian Haitian Creole and other Creoles, yes, ay 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 is exactly right. It's painful to read this. Um, other reactions. Mm -hmm. um, can I can I like speak my reaction? Yeah yeah yeah. Of course. <laughs> um, I was just thinking about how we like consider. Um, oral language to be less than written language and so like therefore keeping Creole like trapped in an oral uh, like kind of box that that diminishes it even further. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and in fact, I didn't include this in this presentation, but that has major ramification for the current struggle for Creole locally and um, this is a struggle that I'm involved in, in very, very deeply in Mauritius. It has major ramifications because a school of thought around writing Creole, um, again, it just says, first of all, it doesn't even need to be written. So it's that school of thought that, that you mentioned. Um, and the, the second school of thought is that, yes, it can be written, but it needs to have the French spelling associated with it. And um, that's a very problematic. And I noticed that in my first slide, I even put au revoir, and I'll put this here, I typed, I made a mistake when I when I did the slide. I wrote au revoir in this way, au revoir, and in in actual Creole it would have been there the phonetic spelling. So this is the way we would have spelled au revoir, and part of the issue with um, that people like this guy Dunyanville have with written Creole that it needs to be avoided with school is that yes he wants to seek compartmentalized, uh, so this is part of a much longer article that um, that he wrote in the in the Mauritian press, um, but he wants to compartmentalize Creole as an oral tradition, and if you dare to even write it, then you need to write it with this spelling, the au revoir, A-U-R-E-V-O-I-I-R, instead of the phonetic spelling that is, and, and he says that anybody writing Creole is going to corrupt the beautiful French spelling. I mean, absolute colonial racist ways of thinking. Um, yeah, you have, uh, Leah is saying, I have some Somali students, and this reminds me of the history of Italian colonization attempts to control the oral traditions. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and also too often in the, in the context of various African um, uh, uh, contexts, we have associated Creole as... Um, and we've we've associated orality with certain traditions and written with certain traditions, and those are never in a continuum. And that division between orality and written is a very problematic division, right? Um, so, uh, so in this sense, Creole is a case in point about that because 
we want to be able to write Creole, we want to be able to, to write Creole in its own terms, with its own spelling, and not the spelling that, that reminds people or forces a French spelling onto it, um, because that has a, an effect on th the way you consider the language. Again, always derived from. Okay. Um, yeah, and some Haitians think Creole cannot be used for development. Duma, absolutely. It's, uh, and the struggle is the same in Mauritius, in Rodrigue, in Reunion. Um, it's a little bit different in the Seychelles, which we're going to see right now. Okay, so take this terrible quote, um, this racist quote, and look at the present situation, the present linguistic situation of Creole. Um, there's really two stark contrasting pictures. So as far as language use, you have 84% of the population reporting speaking Creole at home. Some speak Bhojpuri, which is a, a, an Indian, um, uh, again, an Indian Creole, an Indian-based Creole. 3.6% speak French. 7.1% speak other languages, Hindi, Marathi, Urdu, Hakka, Tamil, Telugu, English, and Arabic needs, needs to also be in there. I, did, I omitted it. Um, but the language policy of current, you know, 2020 Mauritius, English and French are the official languages of parliament. The constitution is written in English. The school curriculum, except in, in the subjects of English, French, and more recently, they, they just introduced Creole as a, as a subject, not as a medium of instruction, again, to really um, drive that point, is in English. And business and trade are in French and sometimes English. So it's a, it's a stark, stark reminder of how um, neo-colonial the situation is. And this is where an, a, an important way to um, introduce that term. Um, this is what we call neo-colonialism. It's the continuation of colonial ideologies and practices after independence. Um, and I like students to understand this because when we teach about colonialism, you know, we teach about independence. Um, there's a lot of glorification of uh, resistance struggles and rightly so, and that is so important. But what we fail to neglect is that the, the current day struggles of today um, around a host of different topics, but language being one of them is a direct continuation of resistance to colonialism. Um, for legitimization of the language. And I can speak a little bit more about how, um, what we've done in Mauritius as far as um, all, all, the, all the different milestones, my, milestones in, in trying to legitimize this language as a national language. Yeah, and if you look at the OIF statistics on Mauritius, they report that 70% of the population speaks French regularly. Exactly, exactly. And that is entirely erroneous. There's just no, um, uh, it's just not, yeah, it's it's wrong. It's wrong sociologically. It's wrong empirically, and um, Creole is the mother tongue of most Mauritians. But you will still find educated Mauritians today, um, very educated Mauritians, who will who use Creole at home, who function in you know let's say academia in French or in journalism in French and or English and we'll say, oh, you will have the same statistic, uh, the same the same stance that Creole is just a language to speak at home. It's not to be used in, in, um, in parliament, in schools, in the constitution or anything else. And, and you can imagine um, the kinds of impediment to political participation, the kinds of impediment to education, the kinds of impediment to, um, to uh, just basic citizenship that this represents for 85% of the population. Yeah, exactly. It's a Catholic church holding mass in Latin, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is an important concept. And I think I, uh, my stance is that it always needs to be taught in relation to when you teach about colonialism, um, just because it galvanizes students to continue the struggle alongside the continued present day, present day struggles. So in the next, well, I've already skipped forward, but um, we have a little bit of time left. Um, I'm going to present to you a, three different activities that can help students analyze present day neocolonialism. Okay. The first is a Jamboard activity. Um, and Anya will send it in um, the, the chat box. 
So it's a, it, this is just a simple Jamboard if you've used it before, but what I've done here is I've put together different uh, linguists um, quotes, different quotes from different linguists locally, most of most of the time in um, in Mauritius from ranging in the time span. Uh, so all the way up from 2020, John Hutchinson to the 1930s to the 70s and so on. And what I like to do if, for students to practice being able to identify I, the ideologies present in what people say, um, the, the, the task here, and I'm going to maybe switch to right here. The task here is really to um, take a quote. Okay. Oh, good. I'm glad you're you all on there. Uh, is to take a quote and um, you have two polls here. The instructions are in the blue and you feel free to copy this Jamboard if you want to use it or adapt it for a different activity. Uh, so definitely make a duplicate of it. Um, so on one poll, normally if we were in, in, in person, I would have students stand on each part of the room and with one poll another and just place themselves on a continuum as they read quotes, you can distribute quotes. But in this, um, in this non-physical world that we're currently in, the Jamboard can often do the same, the same thing, is to work in groups and try to categorize where you uh, would put each stance as for either liberatory ways of viewing Creole as a legitimate natural language or neo-colonial ways of viewing Creole. So um, somebody, do you want to move one of the one of the stickies closer? So the way this would work is that you would take um, a quote, the charm of the Creole Patois should surprise no one. When one considers its true origin and one can see that it comes from the national language of France, the most correct and well-constructed in the world, as well as the Malagasy language, which is the softest and most suave language. Would you put this here closer to a liberatory way? Would you put this here? Um, anybody want to choose a quote and move it? Oh, you have view only. Ah, okay. Well, do you want to tell me where um, we can do this? I can, I can be the one. Um, do you want to choose a quote? I can just speak out. I was just reading the one that's on the far right of the screen in yellow. Mauritian Creole is born out of the efforts of former enslaved. I thought that that was more, um, oh, I just lost the screen, sorry. I thought that was more um, neo-colonial. Mm -hmm. And why? Because it doesn't acknowledge Creole as an autonomous living language born out of creativity and resistance and effort. It just makes it seem like it, it's solely about mimicking a colonial power. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Uh, anybody has a different reading of that quote? I mean, again, this is interpretive work and, and, um, and this is also why I, 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 um, I continuously urge folks to look at the interpretation that goes into looking at archives and looking at primary sources or looking at quotes. So yeah, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Anybody else have a different um, understanding of this quote in particular, the 1972 one? Um, so on the, I, I agree with you that it would be closer to here. One, one question I would say here is that um, that in the words efforts of former enslaved to speak the language. Um, so it, it, there is some agency in it. So maybe I wouldn't put it maybe here. I would maybe put it here um, and we could, you know, we could debate on where that falls. Um, yeah, but, I had to think about it too. Mm -hmm. I mean, because, you know, you could definitely read it as an attempt to be liberatory by like, Mm -hmm. enlightened like trying to tell people like oh look what it is that you're trying to do but then I was like but then if you're telling them this is what you're trying to do instead of asking them what are you trying to do that's like more colonial mindset was kind of yeah. but I also yeah. had to like really think about it yes 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 I agree yeah anybody else want to take another quote and um, try to place it I'll move it for you thank you Sure. The descendants of Africans, of Europeans and American Indians, we have conquered through. Um, that one goes by liberatory ways of viewing Creole. Mm -hmm. 
spells in our own language. Yeah. Can you say a little bit why? Uh, I think it's just saying in our own language um, and then saying in the other languages of the Caribbean, if necessary, I think it's, you know, putting things in the kind of proper perspective there about there's something that we have created together that's more important, but mm -hmm. there are times when you would want to be learning or choosing to communicate in uh, a different language, you know, for your own benefit. Yeah, yeah, there's, I agree, I agree. There's an element of self-dignity here, the right to express, to belong only to ourselves, right? And to de-link and to really, and that that's uh, something, you know, as a concept of really reclaiming indigeneity, reclaiming our own sovereignty over ourselves and our linguistic uh, uh, means. Yeah, great. So uh, we won't go through every point because um, I want to show you two other activities uh, related to uh, exploring present day connections and um, ideologies and neocolonialism. It, and we won't um, have the time to go through everything, but in our in um, in the lesson that was linked um, that Anya linked at the beginning of the um, of the lesson, um, I I translated um, a, the policy analysis from Creole Mauritian Creole and Seychellois Creole. So Seychelles um, as the island that uh, that are find, found uh, nor north east northwest of Mauritius, sorry, um, have a very, very, very different uh, approach to Creole. Um, I mean, Seychelles can very directly uh, has embraced Creole as a medium of instruction, teaches Creole, celebrates Creole. Um, it's such an important case study for, um, you know, reclaiming dignity in language and, and mother tongue instruction. Um, so you um, so one so one thing that I like to ask students what's the difference between those two policies the Mauritian curriculum and the Seychelles curriculum do both policies express a central role for Creole and what's the evidence for that um, again looking closely at the text uh, but would you label one or both of these policies a neocolonial policy why or why not and it just allows students to really reflect on two very different approaches. Um, uh, Seychelles is really um, a wonderful case study for how to do things right as far as policy is, concern is concerned. Um, so take a look at it in the in the lesson plan that uh, Anya, thank you so much for linking it right now. Um, and the third activity here um, is that uh, several issues need to be, uh, so, so should, sorry, uh, the third activity that I urge you to do it with your students is should Creole and Mauritian be used in Parliament in Mauritius? Um, so I've put three, three different um, uh, links here for, for you to, uh, to be able to explore those with students. Um, it allows for really great uh, uh, conversations around what um, what does it mean to speak only English and, and French in the parliament in Mauritius when your mother tongue is Creole? So, and I'll, I'll share with you a detail. Um, so when somebody comes to testify in front of parliament for the National Assembly in Mauritius and they speak in Creole because they can't speak any other language, um, they, the, the, the minutes of parliament proceedings get translated. So even imagine in terms of accuracy that you have somebody typing up minutes that end up being translated into English and then fed back to the population as a fully English document. Um, so there's a long, long, long campaign in Mauritius, which I'm part of to, of course, introduce mother tongue in schools um, and, this, and mother tongue in parliament, the two key areas uh, that really allow for education and political participation. And um, yeah, so this brings us to the end of this session. Um, I timed it so that yeah, you, we wouldn't be going all the way up to 6 p.m. because I know it's been a great afternoon, but um, uh, we need to gather some energy later to, um, to watch this wonderful documentary that we will show at 7 p.m. EST. So I... Um, 
I wanted to end by asking you to do a little bit of reflective writing, a little bit of reflecting journaling. And I'm going to play a soundtrack. It's, it's a two minute soundtrack that, um, that I really lo love. And uh, you won't, there's no translation to it, but it's a spoken musical poem about um, Reunion Creole. And again, think about Reunion Creole, the island neighboring Mauritius that is still under French uh, colonialism, although very few people say, frame it that way, um, who again, speak their own Creole, a slightly different Creole than the, than the Mauritian and the Seychelles one. Um, but it's a really beautiful song. So I wanted to end uh, with uh, you taking down a piece of paper and writing down some key, key notes, key thinking around this session today while we play the music. How does that sound? Oh, there's a question uh, before we start. Do I speak Mauritian Creole myself? Yes. So um, I didn't position myself in this workshop, but I grew up in Mauritius uh, and I am a Mauritian citizen. So yes, I do speak Mauritian Creole myself. Um, which is where where I I draw. So my last name is pronounced V A, like the letters V and A. <clears throat> and um, just to give you a little bit more background about my own positionality in Mauritius, um, there. If if you remember the statistics, um, uh, if you remember the statistics I showed around, uh, you know, three percent of people speak French in Mauritius. So the Mauritian census does not take any data about race and ethnicity. And uh, they have stopped since 1970. And this is part of an entire politics of color colorblindness that they continuously perpetuate. Uh, and it's very intentional and it's a way to mask power differences. But um, my father uh, comes from, I think, a family that, uh, that came under French rule and probably came from Germany. So I, I get, get a sense that um, the, the Ile de France, uh, Compagnie des Indes, uh, was doing some incentives for other Europeans uh, to move to the island. So um, in late, late 1700s. So part of this struggle that I'm part of today is very much as a struggle of reparation to repair the, my own positionality and repair the role that uh, whites and Europeans and French and English have played in Mauritius. Any other questions before we do some reflective writing and then we wrap up at the end? Yeah, France, 100%. I mean, even the word race, race in French, doesn't, uh, it, it's, it has a very negative connotation. And it is, uh, and it's the same in Mauritius, although the colonial legacies are so incredibly stark. And it's amazing how the, there's a collusion between the state and so state being Indian in Mauritius and white capital that um, perpetually promotes this colorblindness in the face of stark inequality as a legacy of colonialism. So, uh, and Creole is 100% is part of that struggle. Thank you. Right. But don't leave quite yet, everybody, because I, I definitely want you to listen to the, to the soundtrack. Um, and then I'm going to announce uh, the next steps at the end. Um, any other questions? Okay, so let me play this. Okay. Can you hear this? Let me actually optimize the sound. I'm going to stop the share. For yeah, a second. I can hear. And then share screen, share computer sound, and share. Um, so take a piece of paper and write a couple of points, um, things you want to take away, um, key concepts, issues, questions. Um, I always find that um, I never take the time to do this or rarely, and I think it's important to do, to do this uh, for reflection, for learning, for next steps. So I'll play the two minute, um, the two minute segment from uh, Creole La Réunion, Ponquet Papin Conter. And, uh, and then we'll regroup at the end and wrap up. Moon ici, moon là-bas. 
Théolophonie, de moun par ici, de moun par bas. Théolophonie, de moun zapan par bas, pour des potes par ici. Théolophonie, de moun par bas, la ni par ici. Théolophonie, pas la langue causée. Théolophonie, nous donne la langue causée. Cause à où Cause à moi, cause à nous. À nous causer. Cause causé, cause créole, cause à nous, causé ban créole, mon ban à nous causer. Créole au fond lit un culture, ban culture. Créole au fond lit un musique, ban musique. Créole au fond lit Maluya, Sega, Boka, Rara, Belea, tout ça là. Créole au fond lit un cari, un bougaï, un satini, un colombo, un tout ça là. Créole au fond lit, une histoire, un pep, bon pep, un dinté, nout dinté. Créole au fond lit, un zambec, un sirandan, un timtim, un cosa et sauce. Créole au fond lit, un tisan, un tijan, un histoire. Nous bonnes histoires, mon histoire. Où dit Nana Haïti À moi la réunion, à où Haïti À moi midi, à moi Martinique, à où Maurice Créole au fond lit, la face à canne sur bonne. Créole au fond lit, à où À moi, à moi, à où À nous, à nous mettre ensemble. Okay. Um. Okay. Um. Would anybody like to share a couple takeaways, ideas that you are walking away with? I would. I think that um, this has really been amazing for me and I hadn't really thought about language is so important. And when I teach about um, colonialism, oh, oh, is my mic off? When I teach about um, colonialism and decolonization, I really want to use that um, language lesson with like about where you went on vacation, because I think that's going to de-Europeanize the way that I teach those subjects. It'll make the, my students understand so much better. Great. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Anybody else want to jump in? A thought, a feeling, a strategy, anything else? Um, so I'm a pre-service teacher, so I'm actually a BU student right now, and um, my senior thesis is focused on um, how we can take French curriculum and like recenter um, like African countries. Um, and I've been thinking a lot about Mauritius in particular, and so I just feel like my whole thesis is now like all over the place. Like there's so much to consider um, and so much to bring in. And I'm like, should I even be doing this about Mauritius? Because Creole is so important and French isn't a majority language spoken. So it's just been like really wonderful to just think about all of this. Yeah, I'm happy to be in touch as well if, uh, to help your thinking um, down the road. Um, I mean, just as a, as a contrast, Seychelles really celebrates Creoles, embrace, cre embraces Creole, along a, a, a multi-linguistic multi ecology. Um, so they are, they, and so it's a really quite beautiful because, you know, so much literature, even from Mauritius, as, as you know, is, is written in French. And there is a Creole form literature as well. But that's not to say that we want to silence anybody because as you, for those of you who know Ngugi Watongo and the larger debate of should we use English, um, should we use English to write about Africa? Should we use French to write about Africa? There's a long-standing debate around that, and um, and that's an important debate to engage with because it's not it's not clear-cut, 
right? What does it mean to have voice? What does it mean to uh, speak about one's reality through uh, a historically dominant term? So I'm of the, the, the school of thought of multi multilinguistic ecologies and um, I would I would urge you to to maybe include that in in the in your thinking, but yeah, we can be in touch. Thank you, Emily. Uh, somebody else would like to speak. I will. Go ahead. Well, first of all, um, I want to thank you. This was uh, very informative, uh, interactive, and um, I had fun uh, learning. Um, from your presentation. Uh, what I have noticed is that, um, so as I'm thinking about uh, your presentation, I'm, I'm saying to myself, um, denying someone's uh, language is also a direct attempt, uh, uh, an assault at uh, identity and, and reality, if you will. Uh, because I think that um, there's this dialectic that no one can deny uh, between cultures when it's when there's imposition, um, it's one thing. But when there's confluence, um, that must be considered also in terms of uh, people coming together from uh, different cultures, and and from this confluence of culture, um, there is something that that enable people to look at. Um, a common challenge uh, and address it uh, in a way that 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 is more fluid or uh, that is more equitable. So as I was, um, that's that's what I got from 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 your presentation. That that movement, if you will, uh, for us to also look at confluence of cultures and not just uh, the imposition of uh, European cultures and and then as if that's all. There was. Um, I, I couldn't help to to think about that that contrast as well. Uh, people coming together uh, to uh, to address uh, common issues or common challenge or problem. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And um, I, I, what what you were saying, Juma, really made me think about how. Um, so Creole in Mauritius and in many, you know, in the Caribbean as well, is often a term for being born on the island of being born. So it's also an, in Mauritius, it, it takes an ethnic, uh, there's an e ethnic identity based um, uh, connotation to the term Creole as well. Uh, I didn't get into any of that, but that's in Mauritius, it's very, very complicated because mm -hmm. historically the term Creole, aside from being a language, it has cascaded down. Um, so it was first talked about as a re they would refer to the colonists as Creoles because they were they, they had emigrated to the island. Right. And then eventually it just cascaded down the social hierarchy. So in Mauritius, um, there's a Creole struggle for a Black Lives or Creole Lives Matter struggle mm -hmm. um, that is very much a Black Lives Matter struggle. Right. And um, as well as a Creole national language struggle, which also is a, a much more um, uh, national struggle, if you will, because uh, everybody considers Creole their mother tongue. So it's, it, it makes for very complicated identity politics locally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, any last person would like to share? Thank you, Juma, for sharing your thoughts. Thank you. Um, I can share, but I don't want to share. If someone else wants to share. I think I think I, you're on there. Okay. okay. Well, what I, I what I was ruminating on while the music was playing was just, um, you know, you've commented several times about sort of the difference between how Creole is approached in the Seychelles versus Mauritius. And so I don't know if you can speak to this. I know it's a little bit of a sidestep from your presentation, but um, I mean, are, surely there are, but like what are some of the internal debates in the Seychelles? Like the way that you talk about it seems a little bit aspirational from the position of Mauritius, which like 
I, I get, but I, I feel like surely within the Seychelles, there's still levels of debate there. I, like, I can't imagine that people are just like, we did it, we're done, <laughs> you know? So I'm curious if you know anything about that. And if you don't, that's okay. Yeah, I, I, there's a lot to say about it. Thank you, Then That's a great question. Um, so one of it is that the Seychelles has, as you know, a very strong, uh, somewhat authoritarian government. Uh, uh, and so since, um, and, and, and another important part of the context is that, um, because Seychelles and Mauritius were part, were um, under the same Compagnie des Andes, and much of the trade and the arrivals of different peoples were from the same uh, origins and same regions, our Creoles, the Seychelles Creole and the Mauritian Creole are very, very close linguistically. So I, I fully understand uh, Seychelles with, with a few phonetic differences. Um, but, you know, more contemporary uh, politics have made for, for um, the government to impose a Creole. And so much of the debates in Seychelles are the same, except that the policy is different. So the debate is still from the elite, for the most part, driven by the elite. And in the, this case, that, that, that quote from uh, Raymond Dunaville would exemplify that, is that um, Creole, uh, so yes, we have a politics of Creole, but it impedes global participation in a global economy. So there's still pushback in Seychelles against Creole, even though it has been the policy since 1982 uh, to embrace Creole again as part of a multilingual ecology. And that, that, that's a force that continues to build in Seychelles. Um, and uh, so I'm not making any excuses for um, you know, the strong government um, and, and uh, civil freedoms, but um, I definitely think that it's the, the, the Creole policy has had such a longevity because they, they have been um, in power. So uh, I'm happy to share more um, some other time um, about the context in Creole, but that's a good point. And it, you know, none of these things are set in stone um, for, for any of us at any point in time. I mean, even just to think of the bilingual education debates here in this country, and how those have gone back and forth, depending on where the advocacy groups are, are funding and who they're funding, whether it be question two in Massachusetts or the UNS initiative in California and so on. Thanks. Great. Okay, um, so I, I, I'm very grateful that uh, you all um, came to this presentation. I'm very happy to be uh, in touch with you if you have any follow up questions. I will, uh, some of you have asked if I will share the slides and I will link, I, I'm going to revise the PowerPoint and we'll, we'll link it from the lesson document that you have, the Google document. So, uh, so you will have the, the slides available to you if you want to use any of them or copy any of them. I do um, also, um, I'm very grateful because this is, I know a very specific topic, you know, in the, in the largest of the topics that, um, that, that uh, are offered. And so I, I expected to, um, to, to have either some Creole of phones, some Creole of files um, or folks who are teaching about colonialism. So thank you for attending. And I want to invite you to, um, since this is the last session of the day, before, oops, let me just, oh, yeah. Um, I would like you to please uh, take some moment to, to do evaluations for us, the African Studies um, Outreach Council. Uh, we are a collection of institutions that have co-organized this together. Anya is here representing Howard, um, but we really value your feedback. Um, so the evaluations, that Anya just sent in the chat box right now. Please, it, they should not take more than four minutes, uh, and they are about the whole the whole um, afternoon so far. Uh, so please definitely take some time to give us feedback. Oh, and I and I see that uh, Lorianne is here um, uh, from the African Studies Center. So thank you for being here too. It matters to all of us, the African Studies Center, the Outreach Council and all of the organizers of this day. Um, and I wanna thank you for coming. Um, definitely be in touch with us, africa at bu.edu. And um, we also want to make sure that you take a break. Uh, you have a good hour right now, um, a good break, and then um, come back for um, Mr. Zadi Zoku's uh, wonderful documentary. And Zadi is with us in the room right now. So I'm, I'm just thrilled to, um, 
to see you here. Uh, you are in for a really powerful evening of watching this documentary together at 7 p.m. US EST. So please, please, please um, take a good break and come back and join us refreshed and fed. Um, and, uh, and we'll see you later.